It is Trinity Sunday, and today in the history of the church, it is common to turn and to look at the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. It's one of those hazy, difficult to get your hands and brain around concepts that the church nevertheless continues to proclaim because it's part of the core of the Christian faith. It goes all the way back to the very beginning, to the earliest period of the church. And did we see elements of it, at least the concepts contained within the doctrine, found within Scripture. We even find Jesus in the Gospel of St. Matthew at the very end, telling His disciples to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We find references in John to, to, to God um, and the Word, uh, not counting equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptying himself and taking on the form of a servant and becoming like one of us, incarnate in human flesh. And, and you also see the Holy Spirit present throughout the Scriptures at the same time as God the Father and God the Son. You also find in the Old Testament, you see references to, to God as Spirit. You see references to God as Father. You see references to God as Wisdom. You see references to God in these many different aspects and characteristics of relationships, relationships that people have had with God, experiences of God in very different, many different places and ways of experiencing the divine. We find these references throughout Scripture that the encounter with God, while it is of one God, it is nevertheless an encounter of God that has many different aspects or characteristics, many different kinds of manifestations. We see that in the Old Testament kind of prefigured in several ways. You, you see, God was known to the Israelites in the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Same God represented, manifested, experienced in those two different ways. God's presence in the pillar of cloud, God's presence in the, in the pillar of fire. So you see, there are multiple different ways of experiencing God, of, of, of understanding God's presence, of knowing God's presence. All of this is sort of pointing towards, at least Christians see it as pointing toward this concept of God in three persons. The word Trinity comes to us from the Latin word Trinitas, meaning the number three. The corresponding word in Greek is trios, meaning a set of three, a set of three things. The first use of the term trios in Christian theology relative to God was by uh, Theophilus of Antioch, a Christian writer in about 170 AD. However, it was Tertullian, a Latin theologian who in the early 200s A.D., and it is believed that he is the first to use the word Trinitas to speak about God being three persons but one substance. Three persons, persona, but one being, one substance, one God. We find the doctrine of the Holy Trinity supported by the creeds. The structure of it can be found within the Apostles' Creed, which we say frequently here. It's also contained within the Nicene Creed, which you will find in your hymnals at 880. The Anglican and Methodist Articles of Religion contain a statement about it. It's Article number one, first importance. There is but one living and true God, everlasting, without body or parts, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness, the maker and preserver of all things, both visible and invisible. And in unity of this Godhead, there are three persons of one substance, power, and eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So at the very top, at the very beginning of the articles of religion that we um, uh, received from the, from the Church of England and is foundational of our uh, doctrinal standards in the United Methodist Church, we have the very first article of religion is on the Holy Trinity. So the doctrine of the Trinity is not something that is, um, uh, can, take or, can be taken or left. It's not optional. The doctrine of the Trinity, an understanding of God as more than just one, but also three, three in one and one in three, is, is central and important. 
It, it reflects an experience of God that is multifaceted, an experience of God that isn't static, an experience of God that is relative to our life and our existence, an experience of God that reflects the fact that we change, that we go from day to day changing, and that our needs change, and that our understanding change, and that our comprehension change, and that our ability to even know God changes over time. It reflects this idea that the experience of God that believers have is not static, but dynamic and multifaceted. In today's reading from the letter to the Romans, we have an excellent, an excellent example of the way in which the Bible contains references not only to all three persons found inside one paragraph, interacting together, but also in this case, it describes how important this whole belief is to us. Now, I must admit, Paul was not writing about the Holy Trinity. He was not interested in explicating a theology about the Holy Trinity. He assumes a theology of God known in three different ways, experienced in three different ways, understood in three different ways. And it's implicit in what he writes to the Romans. But most importantly, he seats us. He places believers. He places Christians within the economy of the Trinity, within the family of the Trinity, within the structure or the set of the Trinity. And he uses familial relational terms to do it. Take a look at Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 12. He addresses them as brothers and sisters. He then says, you know, we're, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. He already makes a reference now to the Trinity by referencing the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Okay, here's another familial term, children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. So we're not servants or slaves of God. We are now children of God, adopted by God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Familial terms, adoption, children brothers and sisters. When we cry, Abba, Father, which is, Abba is Aramaic for Daddy, Daddy, Father, when we cry, Daddy, Daddy, it is that same Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Again, more familial language, Daddy, Daddy, you can't get more family than Daddy, Daddy. And when we do this, it is the Holy Spirit alive within us drawing us to a realization that we are children of God. And if children, not second or third class children, but heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. In other words, Jesus is our brother. Ooh. Joint heirs, equal heirs, congruent heirs of God with Jesus. We're brothers and sisters of not just each other, but of Jesus. So you see, you've got references to the Father, Daddy, Abba, Father. You've got references to Jesus, with whom we are joint heirs and brothers and sisters, and references to the Holy Spirit who unites us together, who makes us adopted children, and who prays through us and proclaims through us, Daddy, Daddy, enabling us to understand and accept God as our Daddy. In other words, Paul here is using this familial concept, this family language, to place us within the very presence of God 
or as later theologians would say, within the presence of the Holy Trinity. It's a dynamic relationship. Brothers and sisters, children of God, Abba, Daddy, Father, join heirs with Christ. He is our brother. In this mix, we find references to Father, Jesus Christ, God's Son, the Holy Spirit, and us as children of God and join heirs with Christ. It is a tight-knit collection of relationships. It is not a relationship of master to servant, with us as the servants, but as being adopted children. And it is known in the context of the relationship. We know God. We experience God. We come to know God in a relationship, in a family-like relationship, proclaiming Daddy. We can speak about the Trinity, and eventually our language and our logic will fail us. We can speak about the Trinity in these ways, and our language will fail us. I'm reminded of my dad saying that he came to a little bit of an understanding of the love of God for us when he saw me coming to him going, Daddy, 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 pick me up, Daddy. And he felt his heart melt. And he knew just a sliver of an instant of what the love of God is like. I can remember sitting next to him as he was tutoring me in math when I was in high school, uh, struggling with concepts and struggling with ideas. And of course, we'd always get off track. I was, he was trying to tutor me in calculus. And here we were talking about addition, subtraction, and multiplication, specifically relative to the Trinity. As I had asked him, I mean, my dad was a man of faith as well as an engineer, and I had asked him, Dad, what, what, what do we mean by the Trinity? One plus one plus one is equal to three, not one. Right? Is that right? Thank you. Now, and I asked him, I said, how can that be? How can we say that the Trinity is one, that God is one and three at the same time? He said, addition is the first order function. It's the most rudimentary. You've got to move up to get a better understanding of God. Instead of addition, try multiplication. One times one times one is? Thank you, one. And he blew my mind away with a simple little statement like that. One times one times one. The interrelationship, the interactions, the multiplicity of ways in which we experience God is beyond our ability to define in the end, beyond our ability to explicate in the end. We can touch it, we can experience it through relationship, just as they have throughout Scripture, just as they have throughout time. We can speak about it in various snapshots from various directions. Another one. My mother is the daughter of my grandmother, the wife of my dad, and my mother. Three different relationships, daughter, wife, and mother, but the same being, Lona Neal. Three different ways of experiencing and relating as a daughter, as a wife, as a mother, but one being, Lona Neal. Now, that relational type thing is kind of the very closest in a very rudimentary and incomplete, and if you push it too far, heretical sense, it is, it is just the beginning, barest start of coming towards at least one dire- from one, at least one direction, the Trinity. The instant you start to push it too far, however, you end up in what they call modalism, a doctrine which says that all you have in the Trinity is the Creator, the Father, the Redeemer, Jesus, the Sustainer, the Holy Spirit, and you how you relate to God through that function of God determines how you know God. 
as creator, redeemer, and sustainer. And it's a problem because in reality, each person of the Trinity is also creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Think about it. If we call Jesus the redeemer, then we're missing that stuff about Jesus as the word of God through whom all things were made, according to John chapter 1. So you can't deconstruct the dynamics of the Trinity with a simple illustration like, my mother is the daughter of her mother, the wife of her husband, and my mother. You can start to, to get your fingers on the reality that it's about relationships, familiar relationships, when we are brought into the economy of the Trinity. But, but to say that would exhaust it or explain it or even come close to doing that is a mistake. Because in the end, it is a mystery beyond our comprehension. On Trinity Sunday, we are called to try to get our minds, our finite brains, around the infinite God that we worship. Around the infinite God that we call Lord. Around the infinite God that we call Jesus. Around the infinite God that we call Holy Spirit. Around this infinite God that we experience in at least these three ways, if not more. We're called to try to put our brains around just a little bit of what has been revealed to us about this deity, about whom the Hebrew called Yahweh Elohim, whom we call Jesus Nazianzus, Jesus of Nazareth, and Holy Spirit. We're called to get our brains just a little bit, to try to open them just enough, to try to encompass just a little bit of that which has been revealed to us about God. So this week I want to encourage you. Take some time to be open to God in all the ways that God is opening God's self to you. Give thought and prayer to your experience of God. Realize that whatever that experience may be, as true as it is for you, and it's true, remember, it's not all that there is. That the mystery of the Trinity is far beyond human brain's ability to understand. Even this one times one times one. It's far beyond that. It's just a snapshot from an angle of a mystery that we in our finitude cannot grasp. This week, even though it's futile, this week, attempt to grasp it just a bit. Open yourself to it just a bit. Be open to the mystery just a bit. Be open to something new and different and an experience new and different just a bit. Be open to it. And remember that your entire life and your entire being is called to be oriented towards a life with this one who is beyond our comprehension. I've been asked many times here and in prior churches why I make the sign of the cross. Why I make the sign of the cross before communion at the end of a sermon, when I say the benediction, when I preside at communion and am praying the epiclesis, the consecration prayer over the elements, because that's something that we're used to seeing amongst Roman Catholics. But in reality, it's a very ancient sign of the church. It's not just a sign of the cross, although it is certainly that. A reminder that Jesus died for us. A reminder of the price that was paid for us. A reminder that Jesus stood in the breach that we created so that we could come into the presence of God. But it's beyond that because when you make the sign of the cross, it's made in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It is a reminder that the mystery of God the mystery of the totality of God, of God, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
is that which comes to redeem us and bring us closer to God. In the vertical realm, to God, and in the horizontal realm, with each other. We're called to be one with God and one with each other. We're made one with God through the Father's giving of the Son. And we're made one with the Father and then within the Son and then with each other through the power and unitive character of the Holy Spirit drawing us together and making us one. It is a symbol that has governed the church and been part of the church's experience for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. The first references to the signs of the cross being made go all the way back to the second century, reflecting their faith in not only the giving, the, love, love, the loving, giving God who is in Jesus, but also the mystery of the power of the Spirit, which makes us one together with Him and each other. This week, I invite you to just crack open your brains just a bit, to try to encompass the mystery that is God just a bit, knowing you'll, you won't succeed, it will always be ahead of you beyond the final grasp, but, but you might taste it. You might glimpse it just, just for an instant. Fleeting might be. Be open to what God might show you about love, forgiveness, acceptance, hope, joy, and peace which we receive from God and which we are called to give to others. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. been listening to a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of the First United Methodist Church in Commerce, Texas, and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2015 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved. For more information and for other sermons by Dr. Neal, visit us on the web at www.revneal.org. That's www.revneal.org. You are also invited to visit us in person at First United Methodist Church, 1709 Highway 24, Commerce, Texas, 75428. This program was produced by Dr. Greg Neal.